Good evening to you all and most warmly welcome to this session. The title is called Lives at Risk, Maternal Health in a Paternal World. We will hear three speakers and then there will be a break and after the break we will have a discussion so please hold your questions. This evening's theme is health related to pregnancy, so-called maternal health. But despite the term maternal, it is not about mothers. In order to get babies, women need to get pregnant. But not all pregnancies lead to babies. Some women decide to abort their pregnancies, and they do so regardless of whether it can be done legally and safely, or illegally and unsafely. It is a fact in all societies. Other women bring their pregnancy to term, but die undelivered, and the babies die with them. Many die after the babies are born. Motherhood does not kill, but neglect of pregnancies, deliveries, and abortions does. It is an ironic fact that while the future of humankind is depending on women giving birth, it is a bi biological fact that a substantial percentage of delivering women will experience potentially life-threatening complications. These women's survival depend on swift access to healthcare. But pregnancies are much more than biology. They carry deep symbolic meanings, existential meanings, cultural and religious meanings. Last but not least, moral meanings linked to human sexuality. The female body carries the proof that sexual intercourse has taken place. There are strong bearing, bearings on who has the right to have sex, when and with whom, and transgressions of rules are evidenced in women's bodies. Therefore, the female body can be seen as a battleground in a power game. Her own rights are so easily set aside. So it is a complicated manner, matter, but we have uh, three eminent speakers to help us guide the way. Our first speaker is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jonas Garstöder. And it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce him. I got to know him during his years with Dr. Brundtland in WHO, the World Health Organization, and I've seen his dedication to better social justice. Now he's not only in a, in, in a, in a political position uh, on his own right, he's also a poli politician who has changed many people's views on how politicians think and how they think how they should speak. Because he has a gift of presenting complicated matters in complicated but understandable ways. And this will be necessary because he has, his ta has taken it upon himself to reflect through the, re the Reflex project on the links between politics and global health. Politics are eventually always translated into community health for good and for bad. But how to influence in the right way, that is the trick. And I'll introduce him with the following limerick. The foreign minister of Norway, with access to high powers doorway, dedicated to health as a basis for wealth, but without gender equality, no way. Mr. Stör, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me back to Trondheim. For all guests and friends from abroad, heartily welcome. I'm a bit late at welcoming you, but it's uh, great to see this great hall being so international. And to all uh, student friends in Trondheim, det er flott å være tilbake. Tusen takk for invitasjonen. Today, I... 
I would like to start my remarks by uh, saluting the students by saying the following. Great things happen by two important rivers in the world today, by the Nile and by the Nidelven. <laughs> on Saturday, on the main Norwegian daily, the front line, the, the headline was the following, Freedom Waits. That was for the people of Egypt. And when I read that title, I said, it's a bit daring to say, because we don't know. We don't know what the outcome of this extraordinary moment will be. But it is really right to hope that freedom will wait for the great people of Egypt, for the whole Arab world, for this part of the world with so much history, so much accomplishment, but so much which has been unleashed. But we don't know. But what I would like to dwell on is the fact that those who really drove the last weeks of Cairo and Egypt, many, the people, but the students were at the front. And the students, with education and with hope and with interconnectedness through the new media, they knew how to upstage really every revolution. Now, I hope you don't do the same at Nidelven. <laughs> But this is also the great moment for setting those international agendas which, needs, which we need to change the world. And I know that the ideas that come out of this room, out of Trondheim, out of this city of University of Norway, have the potential to change the world. And I think that, you know, unless we have the ambition when we meet like this, that what we are here to do is to change the world for the better, make things move forward, think great ideas, have the courage to really address the conflicts and the challenges and the unfulfilled potential, then we are worthless. Because we who are here, all of you who have come from more than 100 countries, in a way you are privileged because you are given the opportunity, but you also hold the potential of addressing the great issues and conceiving the solutions. And I would like to salute ISFIT for having taken that choice of putting global health on the agenda. Now you, yes. And by doing that, you have caught the link of how essential health is to development, how health is the most striking feature of globalization. Just imagine how health travels across borders, how national borders are worthless really to defend ourselves against challenges, or seek isolated solutions. Global health is everybody's business. And it is, again, for the government that I represent, having made global health a main priority in our foreign policy and development policy, of tremendous inspiration to be able to address it here with you. Now, you will hear experts on health after me. I will try to share with you where I come at it, as a foreign minister, as a politician, as a member of a government. I can in no way say that I'm a health expert, neither a nurse nor a doctor or a public health specialist. But I have seen firsthand that unless we are able to reverse the negative health trends, we will not make development, we will not combat poverty, we will not make equality among people. Because this agenda is really about human development, about equity and about rights. So when I came into this, as Berit Ausweg just said, I worked with the World Health Organization, and my ambition was to learn as much about health as I could without being a medical person. And what I really learned, being a political person, was exactly this. In health lies the potential of every individual, of every community, of every nation, and speaking largely of the world. So we have to focus on health, because the truth is the following. Ill health breeds poverty, and poverty breeds ill health. Unless we break that circle, there's no way we're going to achieve development, progress, and ultimately peace, and everything that follows with it. How can we make a difference on that? Now, since 2000, just about, in the area of global health, we've seen the most innovation, the most daring approaches of doing things differently internationally, in the whole international system. On currencies, on education, 
uh, on development, on engineering, I think there's a lot of old thinking. But on health, for the last decade, there has been a lot of new thinking. New partnerships, private public, industry, uh, government, uh, NGOs, civil society, a whole big alliance have been mobilized for global health. That was necessary in order to mobilize resources, to mobilize ideas, to share responsibilities. So it's a kind of a mass movement that we have to build on. And we as a government in Norway decided that we would, we would support all the Millennium Development Goals signed in 2000 with the aim of halving world poverty by 2015. Because the concept is good. But Norway, as Norway, cannot simply say that we will spread ourselves over all those MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. We have to be selective. We have to be strategic. So we went for the health dimension. Partly because Norway, in its development cooperation for decades, has been investing in health. In rural health, in health systems, in specific health interventions. So we have a broad, professional and excellent platform to build on. But also, again, because we need to be strategic and say that we will use our resources there where we may make a difference. So on MDG 4, child mortality, and MDG 5, maternal health, that's where we have decided to place our emphasis. Point one, how have we done that? Well, I will not dwell on child health, although they are related. But that has been through a massive emphasis on vaccination, immunization, and the health systems that needs to deliver them. And I think, by and large, that broad alliance for vaccination has delivered very powerful results. More kids being immunized, more kids not dying for preventable deaths, and the trends are moving in the right direction, although there is still a lot of unfinished business. That being said, the big shame of global public health is the unfinished business on maternal health. And these figures are, of course, many to exemplify, but I think the strongest one which should make us think is that every minute a woman dies giving birth. And for the girl child or for the mother, this is the most precious moment of life, being born, giving birth. Those two moments with very, very high risk. Every minute a woman dies, and six newborn babies die. And this adds up to the deaths of more than 340,000 women and 3.2 million babies under one month. Now, if we go in with this health specialist to analyze it, I think we will see that it is a complex matter. It is not something that can be dealt with with a quick fix. At the same time, it is not about high tech. It's about low tech. It is something where human beings can make a significant difference. And that's why we have to put maternal health in its entirety on the global agenda, set ourselves targets, focus on interventions, and move forward. MDG 5, improving maternal health, shows least progress, and it's the most complex issue from the standpoint of values, uh, prejudice, moral sensitivities around sexual and reproductive health and rights. The UNDP has stated that the lack of gender equality and opportunities for women in many societies may be the prime obstacle to reaching the target of reducing this staggering number. Particularly important is the girls' access to health, education and means of production. But then there is also the whole issue of gender equality, right the women to make their own sexual and reproductive decisions, which are re prerequisites for health. That is why, one reason why we have decided to take on this issue as one of our emphasis in our development policy and in our foreign policy. And let me just spend one minute on that. Because I've seen as a foreign minister for six years now, that there is a direct link between what we can do on global health and international peace and security. 